Back again, and uh, so far in the cardiovascular section, we've we've talked about uh, cardiac anatomy, um, chambers, uh, ves uh, valves, uh, great vessels leaving, things like that. We've also talked about cardiac dynamics and a lot of the physiology in regards to uh, how the heart uh, contracts and and pushing it uh, from one chamber to the other. But we didn't haven't spent too much time uh, once the blood leaves the heart, what happens at that point. So we want to spend the next few minutes talking about blood, blood vessels, and the way the blood moves through the body and discuss a little bit about that. So that's where we're going to go uh, with this particular uh, PowerPoint video. What happens is when we look at the flow of blood, um, uh, we, let's go back to our same old words that we talked about before, efferent and afferent. Efferent means something leaving away from something and afferent means coming back to. What happens is once the uh, heart uh, pumps the blood from the ventricles out, it goes from the heart, at that point, it goes to the arteries. Okay, now arteries follow, uh, are, the, are, the, are the efferent vessels that are leaving the heart to go somewhere else. Uh, we'll talk a little about the structure of the arteries and how they change as they start to get further and further away from the heart because there are some changes that will occur. So blood starts at the heart and blood is pumped out of the heart and it goes through our arteries. Finally, the arteries get really small and what happens is they become what are called arterioles. Uh, arterioles are really important because they really sort of are very important in where the blood is distributed. Okay, uh, Areas that need more blood, um, the, the arterioles will do some special things to let the let blood go to the go, go to the areas that need it and then areas that don't need it at that point in time, the, the arterioles will help in trying to prevent blood from going to those areas. Try to conserve where we want to send the blood and the arterioles are very important and responsible for that. So we'll talk a little bit about, more about that. Um, but what happens is, is the blood hasn't had an effect yet. It's just trying to get to where it's supposed to be. Finally, what happens from the arterioles, we get to the capillaries. And the capillaries are small microscopic vessels. Well, arterioles are small too, but they're a very, these, the capillaries are exceptionally small and the walls are very thin. They start to lose their outer coat. And, the, and we, have, we have basically a tube. It's like one cell layer thin and frequently little pores or little slits in it. And this is where what happens is when we finally get in the capillaries, the nutrients that are that have been carried around, that have been propelled by the heart and carried around from the blood to the rest of the body, are able to leak out of the area of the capillaries to get to the tissues and the cells in the tissues, so they could do their job. Okay, so they could provide that those nutrients, the oxygen, and things like that, as well as all the waste products that have been made by cell metabolism in the whole part of the body, are now able to go from the tissues into the blood, so it could be taken back to the heart. So the capillaries, what we'll find out, we call them exchange vessels. The area where where nutrients are exchanged and wastes wastes are brought in to be able to get to get to get um, eliminated in some in one way or the, or the other. So we finally get to capillaries. Finally, from the capillaries, we go to what are called venules. Venules are small veins. And basically, it's a transition uh, from the capillary, which is a very thin-walled, to venules, which are still relatively thin-walled, to next thing we have, which are called veins. And the veins are basically uh, the, the larger conduits are going to be able to take the blood back to the heart. Um, at any one time, the majority of the blood volume that we have in our body are in the veins. And the reason why they're in the veins is because the veins are very saggy. The walls are very loose. So what, what happens is they can stretch enough uh, to be able to uh, uh, accommodate a lot uh, more blood. Uh, so the largest portion of our, of our circulation at any one time is still left in our veins. And finally from the veins, we get back to the heart. Okay, And then we start this whole thing again. Heart, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and back to the heart again. And a big, you know, ever, never ending circle. And the, the diagram on the, on the, on the uh, right in the picture here actually shows a little bit of that. If we look at this area up in here is the artery. It has a much thicker wall in here. This area in here, across here, would be called the lumen or the opening of, of the artery, much thicker wall, helps to control things. Also, it helps in propulsion. I'll show, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Finally, we get down to the capillaries, and the capillaries would be in this area here, and those are where things are leaking out, and things are coming in, and being to be able to take back to the heart. We get to smaller, the venules in here, finally we get into a vein, and the vein's going back to the heart. So if we start at the heart here, we go this way, let me do it a different color, okay? Start heart here, we go this way, through the arterioles, through the capillaries, through the venules, the vein, and back to the heart again. So it's a never-ending circle. Okay, and we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit more about that. 
for the rest of the day. So where's it all go? Okay, and this is what uh, we'll be talking about more in lab. We'll be giving you a little bit more of a direction, sort of like a roadmap to the body as to how the how the blood actually leaves. But basically, this is what we're showing at. Let's just let's just start somewhere. Let's start here in the left ventricle. Okay, so we know this is the right ventricle on this side. That's the right ventricle. Here's the left ventricle. Once the blood comes out of the left ventricle, it comes up out through the aorta. Okay, and from the aorta, it's going to have circulation that's going to go towards the head. It's going to have circulation that comes down, supplies all the abdominal material, all the abdominal structures, comes down, supplies the legs. And then finally, when we get down to the areas of the capillaries, which are the very small vessels like we talked about, that's where I'm exchanging the nutrients and picking up waste products. Once we finally get down to the periphery, okay, we know that what's going to happen is now we're going to come up from the legs through the inferior vena cava. We're going to come back from the head through the superior vena cava. And where are we going to go? We're going to end up at the area of the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to leave. It's going to go to the left lung and the right lung. And then finally, after that, it's going to come back from the left lung and the right lung back into the left side of the heart again to go that whole process again. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this and give you a little bit better idea in regards to some of the individual structures or some of the more major structures uh, in the lab. I'll be having a little couple um, uh, things that'll show you exactly the, the direction of the blood and the major vessels that I, th that I think you should know and be able to pick out, okay? There's a, I mean, we have so many blood vessels, but there are some that are actually very critical and very important, and those are the ones I'm gonna be showing you. So the blood is, is going everywhere. Again, we leave the heart going out in arteries. If we go, even whether it's the, whether whether it's the whether it's the uh, uh, right side of the heart or whether it's the left side of the heart, blood's still going to leave by an artery and come back by a vein. Just on the right side, it goes through the pulmonary arteries, comes back to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary veins. From the left side of the heart, it goes out the aorta and comes back to the right side of the heart through the vena cava. Okay, so that's the way uh, the blood circulation is. Let's talk about those vessels individually because they have different characteristics. The thing that we have to remember is, especially when we talk about, in, about cardiac dynamics, we talk about systole. Systole is that area of the time when the ventricles are pumping. It's a, it's a time of exceptionally high pressure in the arterial circulation. When they take a blood pressure, again, that higher pressure is systolic, systolic pressure, which is basically the force of that pump that's moving the blood forward as a column throughout the body. So arteries have a tendency, the first thing I could characterize them as, as, high, ten, uh, as, as uh, high pressure vessels. They have a lot of vessel, a lot of pressure in these, okay? And they're carrying the blood away from the heart, which we know. Um, the arteries have three coats to it. They're very thick-walled, okay? If you ever pick up a roast or a steak or something like that, and you're getting ready to throw it on the grill or in the oven, if you look at it, if you see a tube with a very thick wall around it, guess what? That's an artery, okay? Almost guarantee it's going to be an artery. And that artery has a bunch of different layers to it. It has an outer layer, or an inner layer, first of all, let's start at the inside, which is called the tunica intima, which is basically an inside layer there, which is basically very thin. It's a small, thin layer, uh, maybe uh, you know one or two cell layers thick, but not much more than that. It's consistent with the inside lining of the heart. So when that in that endocardium, like we talked about before, continues out into, a, into the vessels, the inside the lining of the heart is, is, is uh, continued on in the vessel as what's called the intima or the interna, okay? Beyond that, we have what's called the tunica media. And the tunica media will be the next layer out in here, okay? The tunica media. And the tunica media changes depending upon where the artery is. The larger arteries that are closer to the heart they're leaving, there's a lot of elastic tissue in there. And I'll explain why the elastic tissue is in there. Um, it allows them to stretch, but that stretch actually comes back with a recoil and actually forces blood a little bit more uh, forcefully, distally, away from the heart, okay? So that's that, uh, the, the media. When I finally get further out to the periphery where I'm getting close to the area of the arterioles, we start to change that media. Instead of being very elastic, we start it to be more muscular. And so we're able to, U-L-A-R, okay. And, um, L-A-R, I can't see my R. So it begins a little bit more muscular, and we'll talk about why that happens. The externa is basically the area around the outside. I should have done that a different color. The area around the outside. And that allows the artery to sort of be semi-attached to the all, all the soft tissue around it, okay? So therefore, it's not going to fly all over the place. And it's, it's, it stays in, in a pretty... Uh, 
pretty localized place. It's, it's, it doesn't move around a lot. Veins have a tendency to wobble a little bit, okay, uh, because there's a thin wall. They're not, and the outside, the uh, externa on the outside isn't quite as stiff and tough. But where the ar arteries are, they're, they're usually pretty well fixed. They're usually in, a, in a, a certain spot. There's a minimal movement of them, okay. We know that arteries are tubular, which means there's a tube, and that inside portion in here is called the lumen, okay. It's called the lumen. I don't know why sometimes it doesn't pick up there. Anyway, that's the lumen. This whole area in here it doesn't pick it up there. But that's the lumen, okay? That's where the blood's going to flow. Uh, again, when we look at these, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the intima, uh, media, and uh, externa. But that intima, again, is continuous with the inside lining of the heart, like with the endothelium of the heart. Very smooth, okay? And that's important. Uh, it's, a, it's a very thin... Um, and very, very smooth. And the reason why it's smooth is as the blood is going through the vessel, we don't want to have a lot of currents in it. We want a nice smooth flow. If the wall of that intimate was rough and bumpy, what happened is it causes a lot more ripples. You know, I remember running a race uh, downtown and running through the flats a number of years ago, and it was pouring rain. It was it was like a 5K. It was a small race, but it was for a good cause. And I ran this thing. It was downtown, and we had to go down from area public square, and we ran down in the flats. And one of the streets you ran down was more cobblestony, and it was raining so hard as the rain's coming down and going down towards the Cuyahoga River at the bottom of the flats. It's going over the cobblestones. You can see all these little uh, waves that are being created by that. We don't want waves inside there. We want it to be nice and smooth. We want that inside wall to be very smooth so that what happens is the flow doesn't have any current in it does, or doesn't have any eddies in it, like like ripples and stuff like that. So that's because it's in contact with the blood. Also, what happens is we find that sometimes when we talk about clotting, the problem that we get is we actually get a crack or a break or something like that in the intima. And when that happens, that actually draws platelets. Platelets create a plug. They release chemicals. The chemicals draw blood vessels or blood cells, red blood cells and we have a clot. So we need to have that nice and smooth and and we need to have a, uh, a uh, surface that's relatively inert that doesn't react a whole lot with the blood as it goes through that. The tuna, tunica media, again, is the middle layer. It's mostly elastic fibers and then some muscular fibers. And the muscular fibers increase the further distal I get. And the idea is the elasticity of them allows them to stretch. So when the blood comes out with that initial force of the systole, the blood vessel will stretch a little bit. But then what happens is when that force goes down and systole comes to an end and the, and the ventricles are going to diastole, we have a, a snapping back to the original position and it actually allows a further propulsion of the blood beyond that, okay? So they can expand and stretch, and again, as I get further away from the heart, I get more muscle, okay? I get more muscle and less elastic fibers. And the external outside is basically mostly elastic tissue and cartilaginous tissue just to hold the arteries, okay? Uh, again, we have a couple of different types of arteries, the elastic arteries, which are basically the conducting arteries. These are the things like the aorta, um, uh, brachiocephalic, which comes off the aorta, subclavian, vertebral, pulmonary, common iliac. The larger arteries are basically elastic because they're carrying a lot of blood, okay? And we don't need them to be able to change size. We want them to have be a nice large conduit. So they're large and medium size arteries that go to the peripheral circulation. Again, they have a high number of elastic fibers, which means they could stretch. So the walls uh, are able to uh, stretch and provide that uh, they're strong. They'll be held together, but they'll, all walls will be able to stretch, but then they, they snap back that because of that elasticity of those elastic fibers, which then propels blood forward. One of the problems is uh, there's a thing that's called Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is a, a connective tissue disorder. Um, we see it in, in very tall individuals. Individuals that are exceptionally tall. What happens is one of the things that causes them to be tall is Mar Marfan syndrome. And Marfan syndrome, the, the problem is they have a, an abnormal type of collagen. So the elasticity of the inside wall of the aorta sometimes is is insufficient. So whenever I sometimes see a you know a 16-year-old basketball player that's a, a 6'11 in high school in the in the in the 11th grade or 10th grade, and all of a sudden uh, has a sudden cardiac arrest and dies, I either wonder if it's a conduction defect in the heart because the elast the elastic because of the elastic fibers blocking the electrical conduction, or there's an, a change in the electrical conduction, or did they blow out their aorta, which sometimes happens in these individuals because the aorta under the 
the pressure of, act, of physical activity, the pressure increases because the heart rate increases, because we talked about that with sympathetic activity increases, uh, pressure increases, heart rate increases, and stuff like that. Um, and therefore, is, is that wall of the aorta in, in Marfan syndrome strong enough to be able to withstand that, and sometimes it'll just break. These people are exceptionally tall. They have a very high arched uh, head. Their, their, saw, their, their hard palate is very, very high. Sometimes their iris looks like it's just floating. Their arm span is like uh, uh, wall to wall, you know, and these kids are, they're, they're huge, they're tall, but they do have physical problems in regards to uh, the, the type of collagen they make, which is abnormal, okay? But that elastic artery, and uh, again, w these elastic arteries, again, like I mentioned, assist in propulsion, because as blood is ejected from the heart, it's the elastic arteries, the elastic arteries stretch, which is making elastic energy, and then what happens is this energy then, the, the, the elasticity will stretch, will, will snap back, and as a result, this is called potential energy when it stretches, but when it's stretched back and it recoils, it's called a kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is actually causing motion, and it makes the, the blood propel, so the, the artery stretches like up in here, but then what happens is when systole stops, we have diastole, the ventricle now, we have the, the wall snaps back and that forces the blood further on down the chain. Okay. Uh, we have muscular arteries, and again, the muscular arteries are one where what happens is that the tunica media starts to change as I get further away from the heart, where I need to control where, where blood's going to. And, and what happens is the tunica media is just changing. It changes from being largely elastic fibers to much more muscular fibers. And as a result, those muscular fiber, fibers, the advantage of it is, is they could open or close, okay? They could relax and open up the vessel or they could contract and close down the vessel. So they're under a neuronal, neuronal con control from like, uh, you know, the sympathetic nervous system and stuff like that, as well as parasympathetic to relax, relax them to be able to constrict or dilate. Okay, uh, arteries that we see are this: is, you know, brachial, radial, femoral, popliteal, posterior tibial, dorsalis piece. We'll talk about these. These might be brand new names to you. What happens is we'll talk about these names um, uh, in the lab when I start to give you a few more uh, some uh, some ideas about about how the how you know the structures, you know, individual names of various vascular structures. I think are important to know. Okay, now what controls these these muscular arteries? Again, the sympathetic neurons, the autonomic nervous system, uh, just like we talked about before. Um, they they innervate these smooth muscles, and we know smooth muscles, as compared to skeletal muscle or as compared to cardiac muscle, are involuntary. So we really can't control them. We can't control the vasoconstriction or vasodilation of my vessels. Um, most of the vessels are actually under vaso uh, uh, or symp sympathetic control. Most of the time. When the vessels dilate, it's because they decrease the sympathetic control. So sympathetic control is more important by constricting it. But and the way I dilate it is instead of parasympathetic control. Basically, what happens is by decreasing the sympathetic stimulation, the vessel will open up. Okay. So with deep, with reduced stimulation, the smooth muscle relaxes and we get vasodilation. It's not as much here in regards to uh, parasympathetic. It's just less sympathetic activity. Uh, some diseases are vasospastic diseases. For some reason reason what will happen is these um, these artery are these muscles in these arteries uh, have a tendency to be a little bit more hyperactive and they will spasm down uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that maybe later on if we get a chance okay arterioles arterioles are really important because what happens is they're, first of all, they're delivering the blood to the capillaries. We're not giving anything out. All the nutrients are still in the blood. They're not anything. They're not going anywhere. Uh, and they're, when, when, when finally the arteries get so small, we lose more and more elastic fibers. Let's get rid of these elastic fibers. Let's start to cross these elastic fibers out, and let's increase more smooth muscle. Okay. Uh, as a result, what happens is the outside becomes a little bit uh, more collagen, elastic fibers, and the media. We lose the elastic fibers that are there, there, and we get more muscular okay so as that's what, what, what happens is as we get smaller and smaller and smaller and close to the capillary uh, most close to the capillary we lose the media and externa and all of a sudden what happens is instead of just have you know where we have a lot of elasticity in some muscle in the arteries uh, we get to the arterioles we have um, uh, more muscle 
and, and even less elasticity. And funny, as I get close to the capillaries, I'm even losing that. I'm starting to make that transition. It's not like there's a line where you stop being an arterial and you start being a capillary. But we start to lose the media and externa as I get closer and closer to the capillaries. The, the, these arterioles get smaller and smaller, and the walls get thinner and thinner and thinner. And funny, it basically just becomes that endothel endothelial cells with a very small amount of smooth muscle that will actually control what goes in and what and what what goes in to the capillaries. Okay, uh, these arterioles are really important because what they do is they regulate the blood flow into the capillaries by regulating resistance. Okay, because they still have muscle in there. What happens is if there's an area that I don't want to get blood flow, the body will actually say, okay, we don't. You know, the in the, in the hypothalamus and other place will say, you know, we and the and medulla oblongata will say, you know, we don't really need a whole lot of blood going there. Let's send a signal down to those arterioles and have them constrict. They'll constrict and they'll actually divert blood to other areas. Okay, so they actually regulate the blood flow a lot by regulating that resistance. Resistance means how much they constrict. More constriction, more resistance. Okay, uh, so and then what happens is it also we find that the pressure is developed a lot in these arterioles simply because as they got smaller, there's more resistance for flood go, for for blood going through them. Okay, there's a resistance because of the friction between the blood and the inside walls of the vessels. So the smaller the vessel. The, the more difficult it is to pass the blood through, okay, which is logical. I mean, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you if you go somewhere and you, and, and you get a, get something to drink and you have a, a straw, but then they bring out those little uh, stir, stir stir straws with the small little uh, uh, holes, basically it takes a lot more pressure to get that up there. So what happens is the pressure going the other way is the same, okay? Uh, so the flow that we find, which is really so important, and this is really a, a critical thing, the flow that goes into the capillaries is dictated by the resistance of the smooth muscle muscular walls of the, of the arterioles, you know, the, particularly the larger ones because I get close to the capillaries, I'm losing more and more muscle. So they actually act as a floodgate. They're able to divert blood to where it needs to be. And that's a really important thing why that arteriole is such an important factor and important uh, vascular structure that we always have to think about. Quite, quite important. And again, when you talk about it down here, this is just showing that here's, uh, you know, here's, uh, well, you know, this is coming from the heart. This is the arteriole here, and uh, this is actually muscle will actually help to, if, if, if we if we close down the, 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 um, um, the size of that, we, we get less blood that's going to go into our capillary bed, okay? And that's what the arterioles do. Now we get down to the capillaries. Capillaries are microscopic. They're very, very small. In fact, you might look on YouTube and you see some pictures of like a capillary, and it looks like you have a bunch of red blood cells, which are anywhere between about four to eight microns across. You look like they're in a line, like a conga line going down the capillary, okay? And what they do is the, the capillaries, uh, not just they, not are they important because they physically connect, connect the arterioles to the smaller veins, is called venules, but they're the microcirculation. They're near almost every cell in the body. There's a couple of places where we don't have it. Uh, the outer layers of the skin, the epithelium of the skin, the outer layers of the skin don't have them. We talk about how we have a lot of that uh, 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 blood below the area where the epidermis meets the dermis, but when we get to the surface of the epidermis, there's really no blood supply. When we get cut, we get cut because we're now making an incision or a cut. It's down closer to the dermis. Okay, the cornea, the eye. The cornea is eye, eye is very inert. Doesn't have a, 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 any kind of significant capillary supply at all. The lens of the eye, cartilage. And that's the problem with cartilage. Cartilage, when it damages, how do we repair it? We don't. We can't. It can't repair it. Why? It doesn't have a capillary supply. And if it doesn't have capillary supplies, it can't get nutrients from the blood. Very simple. So this is the microcirculation near to everybody, near near to almost every cell in the body, with the exception of these puppies down in here. And again, some places that that need a lot of. Uh, Nutrients are very loaded with capillaries. Okay, if they need more nu nutrients, that what they call the capillary bed. The capillary bed is much richer. It's sort of like having sheets that only have a few, uh, a low thread count versus a high thread count. Area you want to be, you know, feel nicer, higher thread count. Area where it's not so worried, worried and like flimsy stuff, low thread count. Same thing happens here. If I need more blood, if I need more nutrients, I'm going to have more capillaries. 
that's that's just logic. That's just common sense. Okay. What the capillaries are, are they're what we call exchange vessels. Exchange vessels is the big thing. Okay. And exchange vessels. And what I mean by exchange vessel? An exchange vessel is the area because the walls are so thin. There's basically a single layer of, of endothelial cells and a little bit of a basement membrane. And there's no media external. Uh, there's no tunica media. There's no tunica externa. Okay. Basically, you just have a tube, very thin wall tube, one cell layer thick with a little base membrane around the outside of it and stuff like that and frequently have little little pores or slits in there and this is uh, because the wall is so thin it allows materials to leak out of the wall through that one cell layer thick type of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a tube to get to the outside to get into that extracellular space where it could go to all the cells and get inside the cells to provide nutrients same thing with oxygen also if I have waste products that are produced by the cells that are thrown out of the cell by that exocytosis, like we talked about earlier in the year. That's why these words keep on coming back to haunt you. Okay, um, what happens is the the wastes that are put out from the cell into the extracellular fluid now could get inside the capillary. When they get inside the capillary, they can be taken back to the heart. Okay, it's the only place of substance transfer. Okay, okay, other than maybe the very beginning of a venial because what happens those venules are also thin-walled, okay? Uh, and that's the thing the capillaries are. Remember, they're exchange vessels. They're the areas where things go out of the blood, of the circulation and into the blood circulation at that point, okay? We'll talk about how the capillaries are really important when we talk about the pulmonary circulation as well, okay? It's extensive capillary network. There's lots of capillaries and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, and again, because that arterial can change the amount of blood that goes into the capillaries, when I need more blood, Blood, those arterioles will relax and provides more blood to the capillary bed. If I need less um, less nutrients and oxygen, and there's not a big problem with uh, get, get, getting rid of waste. What will happen is arterioles may constrict, so therefore it diverts the blood to where it's going to be needed in the arterial. So basically, that's how the arterioles actually control what 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 is exchanged in the area of capillaries. Uh, and again, the, the capillary, this is called capillary exchange. It's a movement of substance between the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid, okay? Uh, red blood cells are too big to get outside the, the, the pores or through the wall, but all the all the nutrients, uh, nutrients like uh, uh, potassium, sodium, chloride, all these things, um, everything we want is not in the red blood cells, but it's carried in what's called the plasma. And the plasma is the liquid portion of blood. Cellular portions, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, red blood cells carry oxygen, but we don't have the red blood cell with the oxygen to take outside the cell. The red blood cell releases the oxygen to the plasma and it goes from that into the, through the capillary wall and gets into the tissues, okay? Uh, 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 you know, they're, they're exchanging materials with interstitial fluid all the time, okay? There's, you know, there's always some exchange of the of of uh, materials, okay, uh, with the interstitial fluid as the blood leaves the capillaries. And what they do is they leave the capillaries by a couple different reasons. Oh, here we go by diffusion. We talked about diffusion earlier in the year, okay? They also leave the blood by what's called transcytosis, or actually transporting it outside, or sometimes by bulk flow, which means it, it follows a crowd, okay? And there's the way we get the we get material out of the blood vessel and into the tissues. So where do we get blood vessel, our, our nutrients out of the blood and into the tissues? At the capillaries with this capillary exchange. That's what happens. Now, what happens is now I've picked up the, the waste products. I've, I've, I've delivered most of the nutrients, okay? Now I have to get the blood back to the heart. How do I get the blood back to the heart? I get the blood back to the heart by venules, okay? Now, venules are small veins, and we're talking about this area right in here. They're small veins, and what happens is they the, the capillaries drain into these venules. Again, they're very small. The walls are very thin. There's only a in, uh, little bit, you know, in the intima, which is the endothelium, like consistent with the inside lining of the heart, and a little bit of a media, okay, and a little bit of a medial media, which is that middle board, middle layer that's in there. At the very close to the capillaries up in here, okay, that would be in this region right here, they're very porous. They're very porous. They're porous so that what happens, they still have a little bit of absorbing function at that point, okay? Also, the biggest thing is that for the departure, whoops, I should just use a different color here. They're for the departure of phagocytic white blood cells. What happens is if I have an infection, the way I fight infection is the body mobilizes white, cell, white blood cells to go to an area of infection, okay? And what happens is, uh, how do I get those white blood cells to where they need to go? 
Um, they line the and it's it's there's there's it's it's a long process. It's a really cool process, and but we don't have enough, enough time to talk about it. What they 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 laminate themselves along the walls of blood vessels, and they sort of tumble along the walls of the blood vessels. There's a center stream, but they move from that center stream and just migrate along the walls of blood vessels. And then when we finally get down to the area of the venules, there's large enough holes or pores that these white cells can actually go outside of these venules. Therefore, what happens is now the white cells, which are helping to fight infection, will go to the area where the bacteria are to be able to help to fight the infection. So basically, we find that the venules at the capillary end, they're very porous, and they're, the pores are large enough to let, let these phagocytic, phagocytic means eating, phago eat, and phago, phagocytic site, site means cell, phago means eat. There are large white blood cells that will eat uh, debris, that will eat uh, uh, bacteria, and they'll leak out at the area of the venules, okay? What happens is we get further and further and closer and closer to the area of the vein, they get larger and they develop an externa or something that holds them to the outside tissue, okay? And basically, well, we, yeah, it's a mess, okay? You know, and we're talking about the venules would be in this area. Let's just go in, okay? Now, veins. Veins are interesting because what happens are low-pressure vessels. They're very saggy, okay? Uh, basically, what happens, they, they, they now develop the three coats like we saw in arteries, but the, uh, the intima is thinner than in arteries. They have a very thin intima, the innermost layer. The media is, uh, is much thinner than arteries, okay? And I'll explain why that's important. And the external is probably the thickest, but sort of webby, okay? It's not all that tremendously tough and uh, resilient, okay? The reason why these walls are so thin, particularly the intima and the media, is it allows the, the veins to sag a lot. Uh, probably about 60% of my circulation at any one time is in the veins, okay? Simply because they're able to, they're, they're, they're called capacitant vessels. They could actually fill to capacity and beyond. Sort of like standing room only in, in veins because they could stag a lot because the walls are so thin, okay? So they're very distensible, very stretchable. So they're able to adapt to the amount of blood flow that's going through them, okay? Uh, the lumens have a tendency to be much larger than the corresponding artery and frequently they look flat. So next time when you have that roast or that steak or that piece of meat or that pork or whatever the case may be, maybe and you, and you start to dissect it before you throw it in to cook it and eat it, what happens if you see uh, that, that uh, tube that has a very thick wall around it, it's an artery. If you look next to it, there'll be a structure that's usually larger than the artery. In fact, sometimes what will happen, sometimes there'll be one artery and two veins. Okay, they'll be together. It's not an unusual arrangement. But the, if you look at the, the, the thing, they'll be sort of like a flat, uh, flat area with a very thin wall that's flattened out, and that's a vein. Why is it flattened out? Because the walls basically are not stiff. Arteries have a stiff elastic wall. Veins, they have, a, they have a very thin wall, so that usually flattens down itself if there's no blood in it, and a very thin wall, and that allows them to stretch a lot. That's an important thing about veins, okay? We'll talk a little about what happens also, we'll talk a little about what's, what we see inside veins, which are really important. Veins have valves on the inside of them, okay? And that's these little things that we see right here. There's a valve here, there's a valve here, okay? And they're little, they're valves, okay? They're fold, they're fold like flaps on the intima, okay, they come up. And what they do is they create a cusp, okay? If you look, the blood in this case would be going up this way. So these cusps would go this way and this way. There'd be a valve, you know, part of the valve over here, part of the valve over here, okay? And what happens is they're important because when the flow comes through the vein, okay, when the flow, let me do it blue because just sort of like venous blood, even though know, venous blood's still red. When the, actually, maybe do this, I'll do this one. It's come up this way. It's a darker red. When it comes up this way, the, va the, the, the valves will open. But what happens is when the blood wants to come down, the valves close and it prevents backflow of, of, of venous blood. Okay. Now, this is a problem in, in some people. These, these, the, the problem is getting the blood from the feet up to the heart is going against gravity. So the way we get the blood from the legs up to the rest of the body, because we're on the feet most of the day, or at least upright or sitting, is the muscles have to squeeze. When the muscles squeeze, it takes those veins, because the walls are very thin, squeezes the vein walls, and forces the blood up. It sort of like squeezes it up. When the, when the contraction of the muscle stops, the blood, because of gravity, has a tendency to want to fall down. But that's when the valves close. So the valves, when the blood comes down, it sort of forces them closed, okay? And what happens is then that uh, prevents backflow. 
here's the problem that we get with these valves. It's not an unusual situation to see these valves fail. They fail when people have an inflammation of the uh, of the veins of phlebitis because it sort of destroys them. They don't become very pliable. They get stiff and they don't they stay like this. Uh, when I have too much backflow and then now the vein is so stretched out that there's that the cusps of that of the valve you know can't even come close to each other they come like this and there's still an area that they could go down what happens is if I get blood the back flows down from there it increases the pressure in the veins that are further on down closer to the bottom of the body it causes those veins to get big which then causes those valves to fail which then causes down the road the next set of valves and down the road the next set of valves and that's the problem with these valves also we find that with certain conditions such as oops pregnancy okay I'm not being chauvinistic but pregnancy what happens is because the uterus with a large fetus and the and the size of the uterus sits on the veins that are coming out of the leg which sometimes increases the venous pressure in the legs and again the venous pressure is normally very low it increases the venous pressure in the legs the veg, the veins start to dilate and as a result the valves become destroyed okay so as a result when people end up with these the, the valves that become incompetent or they don't work that's when we end up with what's called varicose veins, those big wormy-like things that you'll see down the legs, and they have a tendency to, to get worse with time. One thing I should mention, one thing I should mention, is we basically have three sets of veins, okay? And, I, and let me see if I could draw this, okay? So let's just say that this is the outside of the leg here. This is the other side of the leg. And what happens is deep inside the leg, okay, deep inside the leg, I have what are called deep veins. They're inside here, okay? Now, these are the ones that are in the muscle. They're really, really important because when the muscle contracts, it forces the blood up those deep veins. We then also have what are called superficial veins, and they're closer to the surface of the skin. So when we see these varicose veins, the ones we see are these superficial veins. Guess what? A lot of times, these superficial veins, what they are, what they're not a lot of times, but what the superficial veins do is they drain into the deep veins by what are called perforating veins or communicating veins. So we, so the blood that's closer to the surface of the surface of the skin in these superficial veins will actually go through these perforating or communicating veins to get to the deep veins, so the muscle can muscle action, the muscle activity could force them up and to go up towards the heart, okay? Well, guess what happens? If these deep veins get bad, then the superficial veins get bad because it, because if I, if I have blood flow that's, that's, that's backing up, coming down this way, if my blood flow, because the valves in the, in the deep veins aren't working, and I have a downward question, I mean, a downward uh, force of that blood, it's not coming up, and the pressure inside the veins gets big, it also causes a backup. Okay, let me just draw it with something like this, maybe you could draw it better here. It causes a backup in the superficial veins, and those superficial veins dilate, and that's what we see with our varicose veins on the outside, okay? So we have deep veins, that are the ones that the muscles will pump the blood up. We have superficial veins, they're collecting the blood from around the periphery, that actually pump into the deep veins by those communicating veins, and as a result, if my deep veins are bad, my superficial veins become bad as well. If my superficial veins are bad, then what that does is that increases flow from the superficial veins to the deep vein in those perforating or communicating veins, which overloads the deep veins, which then also causes valvular problems in the deep veins. So the valves and the veins are really important in allowing a one-way flow, okay? And when they become destroyed, it's a mess, okay? And get those varicose veins. Um, sometimes we also, and I just mentioned this in passing, because what happens is um, when I look at an area, okay, uh, uh, an area is supplied at, is supplied, and this is anastomosis is an important word that we had, I think we went past venous sinus, which is like we saw in the dural sinus. But anastomosis is um, the body's way of saying uh, uh, this area might need more help than just having one artery there. A lot of times what happens is in many areas, especially if they need a lot of blood supply, they'll have more than one artery that goes to that area, okay? And when they have a union or an intermingling of two arteries, that's called an anastomosis. So you see the word anastomosis, that's where two arteries are close to each other or sometimes they actually connect end to end, okay? 
So, the, so we either have what's called a functional anastomosis. We talked about this in the heart video when I talk about the the the, post, the uh, right corner artery that goes to the back of the heart and that circumflex artery that comes from the left. They don't actually meet end to end, but they interdigitate. So the ends of my one artery, my right corner artery, sort of like blend in and, and sort of overlap the area of supply of my circumflex artery or those interventricular arteries, the one in the front and the back, they come together and they sort of blend in together at the bottom of the heart where they sort of mix and mingle, okay? Sometimes we actually have an artery that will actually join to another artery. Typical example of that, and probably the most classical example of that, is if I look at the, the heart, the major artery that's coming out of how it's gonna be the aorta, okay? What happens is the aorta uh, gives off a subclavian artery. I'm going to just draw one on the one side. On this side, it would be the brachiocephalic that becomes the subclavian and the carotid, and then we have a carotid artery in here. We'll talk more about that in the lab, okay? What happens is from that subclavian artery, let me just draw the subclavian artery here, there's a branch that comes off that subclavian artery and it comes straight down, comes straight down, and it comes right down along the inside lining of the chest, right about this this far away from the, from the edge of the sternum, so right straight down, can't see, right straight down, right straight down like this, and it's, and it's called the internal thoracic or internal um, mammary artery. It comes down the front. The aorta is going down the back. But what happens is between the ribs, let's go back, and you know, this is why I like anatomy, because you see one thing is connected to the other. Why it's important to remember what we learned, you know, a month ago, or a week ago, or two weeks ago, or a month, or two months ago. Remember on the undersurface of the artery, there was a groove. In that groove is an artery, vein, and a nerve. What happens is the reason why that groove is there for that artery is at between each of the ribs along the thoracic aorta that goes down the back, we have a, an artery that comes off the aorta, have an artery that comes off the aorta, be just at, and it runs in that little groove on the undersurface of the rib, it runs around and it comes to the, and it, and it joins with the internal thoracic anteriorly. And this is a true anastomosis, anatomical anastomosis, because what happens is the aorta is here, it joins here with the aorta, comes off, a branch off the aorta, and actually joins with the internal thoracic right there. And that's a true anastomosis. A functional anastomosis, when I have one artery comes here, and it goes, that, goes this way in different, different directions, I have another artery comes this, and it comes here, comes here, 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 and basically they're not meeting end to end, but they're covering the same area, and that's called a functional anastomosis. Sometimes arteries don't have an, don't have an anastomosis at all, and they're called an end artery, okay? Uh, also, the, uh, we can have anastomoses between arterioles and venules as well, okay? But anyway, that's a little bit about anastomosis. I'll talk more about it in the as well, okay? Uh, when we talked about blood distribution, like I mentioned, that if we look at the blood within uh, veins and venules, it's mostly in the veins, it's probably about 60%. It's a large, reservoir of blood that's in the veins. So this area down here is what's in my veins, okay? We also have in the systemic capillaries about 15, about 5%. In the arterioles and in arteries, about 15%. In the pulmonary circulation, uh, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, as well as the capillaries in the, in the, in the lung, about 12%. And the heart has about 8%. So you add that up, that be, all becomes 100% but the majority of the blood that we have is still gonna be in the venous side, mostly in the veins because they're large and then and a little bit added to that from the venules, okay? I just wanna throw in, just to show you a couple things, a couple radiographs, because that's what this is all about. This is just a chest x-ray, okay? If you look at the chest x-ray in here, basically this all points out things. If I look at this border right here, that little border of the heart that we see, that's the left ventricle. The left ventricle will be right there. Well, where's the right ventricle? The right ventricle, like I mentioned in the PowerPoint, is actually in front. So this area right here is where the right ventricle is. It sort of sits in front. You really can't see the right ventricle as much as you can the left ventricle because it sits in front, okay? This area in here is the area of the right atrium. You can see this, see this little thing right there? That's the inferior vena cava coming up from there. And sometimes you're able to see a little bit of the superior vena cava, which would be this structure right there. Here's the aorta. Okay, and right here, this is called the aortic arch or the aortic knob. You'll see a bump right there. Let me get rid of that for just a second. See that little bump right where I drew? Okay, if I'm looking right here, that's the aortic arch or the aortic knob. And that's swinging, the, the aorta comes this way, swings a little bit to the, to the right, goes up, 
and then starts to go backwards. So now this is actually going to the back of the chest and swings to the, to the left, and it's gonna go down all the way through the diaphragm this way uh, into the abdomen. So these are just some things you could actually see. Uh, you can see the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk was going to, would be in this area. In, in this area would be the pulmonary artery and such. So you can see that on that on that radiograph, that chest radiograph. And this is just one that actually uh, you could send uh, spend a lot of time on. And yeah, on, on the right. So this is the, what they've done is they've taken the, the the radiograph on the left and they put a radiograph on the right part of the image, which base and they they superimposed the heart. You can see how see how, see how the right ventricle is sort of like in front of the left. Left is bigger. Why? Because it has it has to pump a longer way, bigger muscles and stuff like that. But you see that right ventricle is more in front, more anterior than anything else. Uh, this is just another one just to show you. Here's that aortic knob that we saw before. I can actually see the trachea. Here's the trachea right here. You actually see there's the carina where it starts to divide right about in there. Okay. Uh, you can see, a, uh, let's, see. let's see, here's a pulmonary trunk right there. You can see some of the pulmonary trunk right there. Here's the left ventricle, right ventricle will be sitting right here. Here's the right atrium. So these are things you should be able to see on a, on a chest X-ray. There's other things we'd have to see. This is just a situation what's called cardiomegaly. Cardio, heart, megaly, enlargement. And what happens is this is where if I look at the diameter from side to side, and if I look at the diameter across the heart, this diameter here should be less than 50% of the total diameter, which in this case you can't see it, 50%, less than 50% of the total diameter, and it's and it's more than 50%, okay? So that's just the cardiomegaly enlarged heart. You see this is all cloudy up in here because the pulmonary arteries are getting full. This just shows the uh, on, uh, how you would see a heart when it comes down to looking at the coronary arteries. Uh, if we look right here, okay, what you're able to see is this right here, this little knob right here, Okay, that would be the aorta. And here's my right coronary artery coming off to the right. The right atrium is right there. This is the right atrium, right ventricle. It sits in that groove, that coronary sulcus between the atrium and the ventricles. Left coronary artery, this right here, this area right here would be the pulmonary trunk. That's the pulmonary artery in purple. And that left coronary artery goes underneath it. That's why you see it like a hazy. And then finally you see it coming out the other side. This is that left anterior descending coming down here. And the left coronary artery is going to continue around to the back where it meets the right coronary artery and that functional anastomosis on the back side of the heart. Okay, just looking at that. And this is just, again, looking at, at, at coronary arteries. Uh, if you go into uh, interventional radiography uh, type of a situation, you'll see these. They'll be doing cardiac casts all the time. I think in my life, I've probably had five or six of these, okay? Um, anyway, that's what we see. This is the circumflex artery here. Here's the left anterior descending. You don't see the right coronary artery because they haven't put it, in, put it in here. Here's the circumflex left anterior descending. Uh, here's the circumflex again. Here's the left anterior descending artery. Okay, here's the right coronary artery. So here's the catheter. There's the catheter. There's the tube. They put this in the right coronary artery, and this is going to the back side of the heart. Okay, and so that's what we see is going around to the back side of the heart. They'll be able to tell that. This is just an aortogram. Okay, here's the left ventricle right here, and here's the. If you look, this is actually sort of cool. Look really close. See, how it looks like a little bubble here and a little bubble here. That's the aortic valve. And you see how it's wider. How this is. Okay, this is called the aortic sinus. Aortic sinus. Aortic sinus. It's wider. And the reason why it's wider is interesting because, first of all, my right coronary artery is coming off here, and my left coronary artery is coming off right there, just above where the valve would be. But what happens is because the valve doesn't have those mus those leaflets with the muscular, with the cords and the, mu and the papillary muscles that tighten up the cords. What happens is the leaflets are very thin. So when the leaflets open, if the wall of the aorta was very narrow here, if the wall came down like this, was narrowed, much narrowed down, the, wall, the leaflets of, those, of the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve would stick to the wall of the aorta or the pulmonary artery. So therefore, this aortic sinus prevents that from happening a little bit because it's a little bit larger. This is another aortogram, okay, where you could actually see this white line up in here. That's actually the catheter. You can see the end of the catheter right here. So this is this is the, the blood. It's actually the, the, the aortic valve is going to be down in here, okay, it's going to be down in here. Blood's coming up this way, and this is that aortic arch. This is where it's swinging to the right and up. Here it's swinging posteriorly and to the little bit to the left. And finally, this is this. So this is called the aortic arch. 
in here. This is the descending aorta. This is the ascending aorta. Okay. Let me get rid of those things because I want to show you some more stuff here. Okay. And what happens is off that aortic arch, I have three main branches. I have branch number one, and that's this one right here. And that one's called the brachiocephalic, brachiocephalic artery. And if you see, when you come up here, you see a branch that comes this way, and you have a branch that comes this way. This one right here is the right common carotid. This one right here is the right common carotid. This one right here is the right subclavian artery, the one that where the vertebral. If you see this artery right here, ooh, I like that, I like that, that's good. That's the internal thoracic artery, the one I was talking about just a few minutes ago. It's the first one that comes down right from the area of the subclavian right about here. This one's going to the arm. This branch right here is the left common carotid. And this branch right here is the left subclavian. Okay, so I have my brachiocephalic, okay, which then goes into my right, right subclavian and right common carotid. I have my left common carotid and I have my left subclavian that are coming out here. That's a nice picture. I like that. That's a really good, really good picture. Okay, I like that. And there, if you can't remember that, there it is. It's all listed for you so you can see what it is. Okay. Now this here is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here's the aorta down here. Okay. And then what happens is this is dividing. This is called the iliac, common iliac right here. This is common iliac here. And this is where it's good. This one's going to the right leg. And this one's going to the left leg. Okay. But right here, the, you can see a little bit of the kidney shadow right here. Okay. But this one right here is just an area where there's there's um, th there's a sac that's around that that's full of filling with blood. And that's called an aneurysm. This is another aneurysm. Here's the aorta right here. What's this? That's a kidney. The other kidney is sitting right in here. And what happens here is that iliac coming this way, iliac coming this way. And here's a thing called an aneurysm. What happens in an aneurysm, it's an arterial problem where the wall, for some reason, starts to, to expand. Either the, the, the connective tissue in there is not good, there's damage to the inside, or whatever the case may be. And what happens gets larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. These can be quite large, so usually more in common in males. Usually if they're less than five centimeters across, they probably won't rupture. They, then the key word there was probably. But once they get above five centimeters, the chance of them actually breaking is, is, is pretty, pretty big. Therefore, they usually do surgery. And what they do is they actually uh, divert the flow. They stop the flow here and here. They put a tube inside, okay, and connect it right here and connect it right here and just take the wall and flap it over because, you know, why, why take it out? Just use it for more support over the top of it, okay? So that's just called an abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's, 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 um, it's at that point right there. Uh, this is another one. And you can see this here, there's an aneurysm here. Here's the common iliac, common iliac. And this is the renal artery right here. Here's a renal artery, here's a kidney, and here's the other kidney. And this is an area that's quite widened. It's starting to widen a little bit. They also have what's called a dissecting aortic aneurysm. And these are interesting because what happens is I have, let's say, let's take my, let's take a big wall here, okay? Okay, here's the wall of the artery. And let's take the intima. And the in, and so, so let's, oh, let's go put a media here, okay? And let's put a little bit of an intima inside there. Let's say it's take a green, okay? And the intima is right here. What happens in a dissecting aortic aneurysm, you get a hole in the intima. And when the blood comes down, it actually hits that hole and separates the intima. The intima goes this way and forces the media that way and creates a channel. And as the pressure, because it's high pressure, it makes that gap between the two bigger bigger and longer and longer and it dissects along the arteries it's called dissecting uh, aortic aneurysm if you ever hear that term but that's what that means you know anyway that just tells you a little bit about the vessels uh, arteries uh, arterioles capillaries venules uh, veins and a little bit about how the arteries work in the lab we're going to be talking a little bit more and I'm still working on getting that ready for you the the, the arterial structures that are going to be important for you to know okay there are certain things that I think uh, are really nice to know we'll first talk about cardiac structures which you talked a lot about basically in my in in the first uh, the first uh, uh, a lecture here the uh, 
PowerPoint video, we talked a lot about that. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about which vessels. I'll give you a list of vessels that I think are really important for you to know. And we'll be able to make a little tree as to where these vessels do go. Okay, And that's going to help you a lot in regards to how do I trace the blood from one place to the other. And basically, you know, there, there's a few. I mean, there's probably maybe, uh, maybe 25 or 30 arteries, I think, that are very important and critical to know. And I'll be talking about those in a lab. So hopefully you learn a little bit about how the blood gets there, how the blood gets back, what happens at each section uh, of the of the uh, arterial and venous tree, and uh, uh, that sets the, the stage for the lab when we talk about where these structures go. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please make sure you let me know, and I'll be more than happy to answer any question you ever have. I always have, and I always will. Hey, be safe, be healthy. Okay.